please silence all electronic devices. <laughs> Welcome to South Congregational United Church of Christ on this uh, first Sunday in October, on this beautiful fall morning, as we uh, gather to celebrate uh, a number of things, to worship and praise God. Uh, this is also Worldwide Communion Sunday, so, uh, where a number of denominations all make a point of highlighting the fact that uh, one of the things that brings us together is the Lord's Supper. And so uh, we celebrate that here this day. This is also a special day in our life and we welcome everybody here to worship and we welcome everybody who's watching at home. And uh, we're glad that you're here for a very special Sunday as we welcome the Reverend Tom Carr, who will be uh, sharing God's word with us. And uh, there's, a, there's an extensive biography here in the bulletin that tells you all of the, uh, the skinny on Tom for those who don't have a bulletin, especially those at home. Tom is an ordained minister of the American Baptist Churches, USA, former pastor of four ABC congregations, and most recently retired from Second Baptist Church of Suffield. He is certified spiritual director for nearly four decades, has been involved in issues of ecology, environmental justice, and spirituality with local congregations, ecumenically and on an interfaith basis. He is the co-founder of the Connecticut Interreligious Echo Justice Network, IREGN, JN, and the American Baptist Church's USA Creation Justice Network. He is also part of the National Religious Coalition on Creation Care. He is blessed to be married to Peg Carr for 43 years and has two adult children, Sarah and Jeff, and a daughter-in-law, Sarah Lombardo. Um, he also brought along with him the uh, director of the Inter Connecticut Interreligious Echo Justice Network, Terry Eichel, who will be uh, doing a solo uh, piece this morning during our worship service. And uh, Lisa has a little bit more information about Tom and Terry uh, and the program that is coming after church. Um, the, I don't think there's anything else that uh, we need to announce. Uh, you can read, you can read your uh, things in your bulletin. There, uh, I'm not that that I need to announce. There's always things that come from that side. So, Lisa. Good morning, friends. A couple of brief announcements today. First of all, a gentle reminder that both Tom and Terry will be leading second hour presentation, reinforcing the message of saving what you love, and also sharing their work with the Interreligious Eco-Justice Network. Come to be inspired, to learn something new, and most importantly, to be enveloped by hope. And yes, there will be snacks. Secondly, next week is Community Sunday. We have invited our East Hartford neighbors and friends to join us for pumpkin painting, cider, and donut holes, but the missing ingredient is you. Please consider sharing the love of God through this time of outreach and fellowship. Whether you are three or 103, you are welcome here. And by all means, bring a friend. Did I mention that the Girl Scout troop that meets in this church will also be with us that day to share cider and mingle with our guests? It's true. So this should be a joyful South community event. We look forward to seeing you both after church today and next week. Thank you. Good morning, Felix Pierce. I'm always happy to have Lisa go out first because she gets the crowd warmed up. <laughs> but Habitat may be my thing, but it's the willingness of people to volunteer that brings it to life. Whether you worked on the build site or in the kitchen making our bagged lunches, you were doing God's work. The homemade cookies were awesome, by the way. Yesterday, eight volunteers from South Church worked on site on the Habitat build on Burnside Avenue called Burnside Hope. 
I want to thank all the volunteers for stepping forward because this outreach would not be possible without their support. I also want to acknowledge two monetary gifts in support of this project. One from the church for $500 through a combination of mission and CEFI funds <laughs> and the other an anonymous donation from church members. I'm grateful for this support because it speaks to the impact South Church can have in the wider community. This faith community can dream big, but it will take our combined efforts to bring those dreams to reality. Thank you. Well done, Felix. Good morning, everyone. My name is Linda, and this is my friend Bones. And we're here to talk to you about Trunk or Treat. Less than three weeks away, we'll be having our annual Trunk or Treat Festival here at the church. And there's two ways you can help out if you like. Uh, you can be a trunker and decorate your trunk and provide candy for the kids coming through. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also just provide candy. There's a box in the office, in the church office, that you can add some candy to. I will be out in the crossroads taking names of anybody who would like to be a trunker. And we hope to see you there. Thank you. And if you leave candy, I like Mounds bars. <laughs> Are there any other announcements? Are there any joys or concerns that you would like to have included in prayer? Yeah. Great. Are there any others? Yeah. God bless you. Liz. Prayers for Tracy. Carol. We also continue to pray for uh, our brothers and sisters in the Carolinas and uh, people who were impacted by Hurricane Helene. <clears throat> Are there any others? If not, then following along on the, uh, the model of our Lord, let us uh, take an opportunity to rise and greet one another, passing the peace of Christ with whatever gesture you deem appropriate.
Good morning. I'm Chris Fonestock. Will you join me in the call to worship? With hands and hearts wide open, through acts of love and lives of courage, with open minds and songs of hope, we listen within the web of life and hear creation's call to live as one. join in the prayer of invocation. Open our eyes so we may clearly see the wonders of your creation. Release our tongues to share the knowledge you impart. Transform our religion so its major focus is no longer on our own benefit, but on ministering to others and our faithful care of the earth, which blesses and sustains us because it has been blessed by you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And are there any additional joys or concerns anyone may like to add? If not, Then let us join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. Let us be in our time of prayer together.
we gather on this amazing autumn day loving God. We gather here to worship and to praise you. We gather here to hear your word and to respond to your call. Your call to, for us to be stewards of the gifts which you have so generously bestowed upon us. To be aware of our place in the web of life and how we are just one of many equally important parts of that web. Our web of life brings us in touch with people near and far. And so we gather here in this moment to offer up our concerns for those people, many of whom are afar, for whom we wish to pray, for whom we wish to have you pay special attention to their particular circumstances. We pray especially for people in the Carolinas and the southeastern United States who were so devastated by Hurricane Helene, for people who are still without power or access to outside places, for people who are involved in clearing roads and rescue operations, for people who have begun to rebuild, for our government agencies who are bringing aid and assistance, for charitable groups who have gathered clothing and food and various financial contributions to help our brothers and sisters. Keep all people patient and hopeful and strong in these challenging times. We also continue to pray for people in the Middle East, for people in Gaza, people on the West Bank, for Jew and Palestinian alike. We pray for a peaceful resolution to the now year-long war going on. We pray for your shalom to come down upon this special part of the world and that they might find a way forward to live in peace and harmony with their brothers and sisters, aware that the well-being of one helps to create and empower the well-being of all. And we also pray, loving God, we pray for Tracy, for prayers for her, for strength and peace in light of a serious diagnosis that she has just received. We also pray for Tracy and her continuing illness that doesn't seem to want to resolve. We pray for people who are facing medical circumstances, marital issues, challenges of life. We pray that you would be a healing force and a light in the darkness of their lives. But we also pray, loving God, we pray prayers of joy, especially for Bill, who went through his heart surgery on Friday well and is in Hartford Hospital well on the way to mending. And we pray that his surgery will help to help restore him to fullness of life. And we pray for Peggy on her return to church and her continuing move toward the health that you intend for each and every one of your children. The prayers that we have lifted up out loud, loving God, we now bracket with the prayers which we lift up to you in the silence of our hearts and our minds.
all of our prayers, those spoken and those spoken in silence to you, have been lifted up to you, loving God, in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we might know peace in our lives, in our homes, in our places of work, in our places of play, in every place where we go, that we might know you are present with us, carrying us, guiding us, and sustaining us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lilies of the field do not spin, and birds of the air do not gather into barns. We cannot hoard the abundance of God for our exclusive use. Let us share that all may be blessed. Our morning offering will now be received. Please join with us in the unison prayer of dedication, which is printed in your bulletins. We have bread, so we will share. We have pure water, so we will give to dig wells for others. We have faith, so we will tell others of great things you have done and show them through our own lives. These sacred moments of giving 
acknowledge your ownership of all our possessions. We seek to answer your call to responsible to stewardship of our possessions and the creation from which all receive has sprung, as well as a commitment to faithfulness in mission. We are your heralds and disciples. Empower us and bless us once again. God of amazing grace. Amen. Our scripture reading today is um, 1 Corinthians 13, and that's 934 in your pew Bible. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. <clears throat> love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, <clears throat> hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we, only, we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought as a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been known fully. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Um, the other scripture verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes, who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to be here today. It is wonderful to be here today. And boy, after Terry singing that song, holy cow. <laughs> Let's all just go home, right? <laughs> that is wonderful. It is, it, is, it is a joy to be here, and I'm grateful. So very, very grateful. Will you join me in a time of prayer? Speak, Lord, for thy servants listen. And as this servant speaks, let him be ever mindful that beyond all those he sees is one he does not see, but who always, always listens. Amen. About 25 years ago, <clears throat> I fell in love with a place in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. The place is bisected by a hiking trail which runs along a mountain stream which falls and dances, roars and sings on her way down the mountainside over boulders and fallen trees. She's always going down, 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 down as water always does, seeking out the lowest places to bring health and life. 
And I can hear the water on her way down whenever I stop and listen on my way up. The rather steady and often steep trail, taking often in the songs and calls of a half dozen variety of birds. And when you step out of the thick green forest of pine trees, maple, oak, beech, and birch, you'll go onto a rocky granite ledge overlooking a valley about a thousand feet below where the mad river runs. And then you look up and you can see the mountain peaks. And to the left, or the northeast, I think it is, if it's spring or summer, and you look up the mountains, you'll see white and purple and blue wildflowers in bloom amidst grasses and patches of trees and more granite. And if you keep on looking on a sunny day, you can see the sky that's so blue that it can literally hurt your eyes. But keep on looking because you just may see a hawk, usually a red tail, gliding, and circling without a beat of her wings as those drafts of air go higher and higher. This is a place that makes my heart sing. And I pray there often without words because words can only diminish the sense of sacred mystery that I know when I pause and am in that place fully. I'm in love with this place. Do you have a place or places that you love? Close your eyes for a minute, unless you're going to fall asleep. Close your eyes and just picture it, just for a moment. It doesn't have to be a mountain. It doesn't have to be a lake, a forest, or the ocean. It could be right where you are, in this sanctuary. It could be in a city, at home, around the dinner table. What's there? Who? is there and how does it make you feel when you are fully there how does it make it feel deep down inside well let me tell you about a place of love that we are all a part of a place we all share this place is beautiful filled with abundance, full of life, wild, diverse, amazing life, light and darkness, water and air, plants and trees, animals and birds, mountains, streams, fish, frogs, people. Here is the perfect place, the absolutely perfect place for life as we know it to flourish. The most amazing, beautiful, bountiful place that we know of in the entire universe. And it's our home. Earth. The home of love. Because it was created in love, with love, and for love by the one who is love. God. Right here. Our earth home is and always will be the dwelling place of the one who created and who continues to create all, the one who is love. For God so loved the world that we just heard. God so loves the world, writes the author of the fourth, fourth gospel, the gospel of John. This is the first Bible verse that I memorized when I was a child, growing up at the First Baptist Church of Royal Oak, Michigan. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe it in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And what may be the same for you, I was taught, or it was assumed, that God so loved the world really meant that God loved the people of the world. And that the point of this passage, or at least one of the points of this passage, was that if you believed that Jesus was the way uh, to God, that you would be with God in heaven after you died. So don't worry too much about what's going on down here with people or the rest of the world. Keep your heart focused 
up there. But over the years, I ran into a little problem with that interpretation, and it actually, it's, <laughs> the problem came because of what the text actually says. You might know that the Greek word translated here, world, in this passage of scripture is cosmos. Which is really interesting because the author of John's gospel could have used a different word to express what I once assumed was the obvious point that God's primary concern is with the people of the world, us human beings. As I was told by a Greek Orthodox priest about 25 years ago, there are other Greek words that mean the people of the world, but John chose cosmos. And cosmos means what? Do you know? Everything. Everything. People, yes. And plants and bugs and birds and soil and sky and seas and mountains and sun and moon and stars. Everything. The whole thing. Why did the author of the Gospel of John choose this word cosmos? I don't know. Because I wasn't around 2,000 years ago to ask him. But most likely, it is because God is love. And love is the creator of all life. Love is the very ground of life. And this creator, this one that we call God, loves all. All life on earth, human and other than human. God so loves the world. The question for me and you is, do we? Well, from all the empirical evidence from every place on the planet, it seems quite clear that we humans, through our way of life in the last couple hundred years, rather than love what God loves, we're destroying her. In so many ways, we are experiencing this right now. From the climate chaos that's not some future happening, but it's going on right now. We just experienced that here in America, but it's been going on all over the world. There's strip mining of forests and mountains, species extinction, and polluted water and air. And by the way, did you know that the United Nation a few years ago declared that air pollution was the number one cause of death all around the world? Nine to 10 million people die of air pollution related um, diseases. And I could go on and on. But you know this. You know what's happening. You know that God's planet, our only home, is being severely degraded. This is where we are. This is the truth. And we deny or ignore the truth or be apathetic about it at our own peril and that of the future. Our children and our grandchildren. So I ask again, do we love what God loves? Let me tell you about someone who clearly did love what God loves. Someone who in the Roman Catholic tradition, his feast day was this past Friday, October 4th. This was the one who speaks to us through the centuries because of how he cared for the poor and the outcast, the weak and the vulnerable as well as his love for the other than human creatures of God's. Anybody know his name? St. Francis of Assisi. 850 years ago or so, this son of a prosperous uh, silk merchant experienced the presence of God in deep and powerful ways which led him to give his life to Christ's service. The self-sacrifice, compassion, and love for the least of these, Christ's brothers and sisters. And as his love for Christ grew, he began to see and experience the presence of God, not only within all people, but within all life. The entire creation became for him what theologians call a theophany. 
which means a manifestation of the goodness of God. For Francis, all creation was a mirror of the divine, a reflection of the creator of all. And this powerful reality grew deeper and deeper inside of him and more and more made him live out his love for God because he recognized that everything is energized through and by and with the love of God. And the deeper he grew in his relationship with Christ, the more he found himself intimately related to everything in creation. Everyone, everything, large and small, was his brother or sister. As we read in the Canticle of the Creatures, which is in the bulletin, uh, by the way, uh, he came to realize more than seven centuries before quantum physicists said it was so, that he was related to all life, to all creatures, no matter how small or different, because everything shares in the primal goodness of God. Even rocks were alive to him. In fact, St. Bonaventure, who was one of his earliest biographers, along with Thomas of Salano, he writes that before Francis went out for a walk, which he did quite often, he would ask the stones and the rocks permission to step on them. Anybody do that? And the worms. Thomas of Salina writes about when he saw a worm, he'd pick it up and throw it off the rocks so nobody else would step on it. Or a horse or a cart. Yeah, everything is infused with the love of God. And Francis knew this deep inside because he knew that it was the source of his own life. He discovered that he was an integral part of the cosmic family of creation, the cosmos that God so loves. He loved what God loves. Do we? Which leads me to an obvious question. What do we do? What do we do about the planetary mess that we humans have made because of our way of life in the last two or three hundred years? Which is a good question. It's a critical, essential question, in fact. And we need to deal with this. In the way our, our economies are structured and our political processes are enacted and what we do with the discoveries of the sciences. And yet, over the almost four decades that I've been working on this, I've become more and more convinced that the crisis we are in is not primarily a question, is primarily a question of the spirit. It's a matter of the heart, a matter of love, which is the very heart of the Christian tradition, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know, there are some scientists who agree with this. A decade ago, Dr. Gus Speth, a scientist and lawyer, he's former chair of the President's Council on Environmental Quality, former dean of Yale School of Forestry, president of the University of Vermont Law School, said this, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Who does? Do we, church? Are not we the ones, those of us who follow the way of Jesus, which is the way of love, supposed to know how to do what the scientists don't know how to do? Oh yes, the, the economic, industrial, and political systems and structures of the world must be radically transformed. And yet I don't believe the primary, that we face primarily an economic or political or technological issue. This is first and foremost a matter of the heart. This is a matter of our spirituality. The real crisis lies inside of us, in the human heart and how we see the world, 
our worldview. Because you know what? The world, this creation of God's, is not a thing. Creation is not an it, a commodity, a private possession to own and buy and sell and use however we want and then throw it away. Whatever away means, <laughs> it always goes somewhere. Yeah. As Francis of Assisi knew so well and lived so well, we are of earth and an integral part of earth. We are earthlings. Science tells us this. But if you don't believe it, go look in the Bible. Huh. Take a look at the book of Genesis, the second chapter where God creates human beings. From where? Remember? From the earth. From the soil. From the ground. In Hebrew, it's the Adam, the man, because it, in Hebrew it's masculine. Adam from the Adama, the soil. We are in intimate relationship with what we call the natural world. All of God's creatures, all life. You know why? Because we are made in love. We are made for love. And we are made to love what God loves. And love never ends. Love never ends, as we heard in that great and powerful passage in 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, all else will pass away, but love never ends. And I believe that this is what Jesus is calling you and me away from bearing the love that is within us, away from alienation from other humans and the other than human world, and allowing ourselves, not unlike St. Francis, to have a spirituality rooted in intimacy with all of God's creation. As we immerse ourselves in the atmosphere of life, the dwelling place of God, who is love, you and I and everything else in this cosmos that God so loves are in love and within love, just as fish are in the sea and clouds are in the sky because love, love surrounds, penetrates, and permeates us just as love does with all else in this amazing creation of God's. In the words of the great Sufi, Muslim, mystic, and poet Romy, let the beauty we love be what we do. And there are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. Jacques Cousteau, remember Jacques Cousteau? Jacques Cousteau once said, we save what we love. Will we? Amen.
So we are about to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper uh, here at the South Congregational Church. Uh, we believe this is a table that shows God's love. And since God's love is for all creation, all creation is invited to come and to join us around this table to celebrate the gifts of God in wheat, in grape juice, in the various elements that are up here on this table. And many breads from different countries represented on the plate over here uh, to remind us on this Worldwide Communion Sunday that the th one of the things that joins us together as Christians is the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And even though there may be specifics that do separate us, we celebrate it to remember that God wants all people to come to this table to hold hands around the world, around denominational differences, and to join together because we are God's beloved and we are here to share God's love with the world. And so, <clears throat> no matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, no matter what your religious background is, no matter whether you come here fully faith-formed or still a little... Uh, what's, a, what's a thing that's... Something that's forming. Nympho, nymphoid, or what are, what's, what are those words? Uh, if, whether you're still in formation, whether you don't know what happens at this table, Jesus invites you to come here to allow the Holy Spirit to work on you, to remind you that if nothing else, that you are a beloved of Christ, that you are God's creation, and that God loves you, and God wants you to go out and share that love with the world. And so you are all invited to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. You are going to be coming forward. Um, you can take a piece of bread uh, from Tom and then come and dip it in the cup. Um, there are the familiar hourglass ones if you prefer that method of uh, receiving the Lord's Supper. Uh, but no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome to come to this table. If you cannot come forward or if you choose not to, uh, just remain where you are and we will bring the elements to you, as I like to remind you. Uh, 
There are times when we need to get up and make the effort and come forward to show God and to get down. Be careful what you step on because you never know what's going to be on the ground there. And that this is God's gift, the, the gift of God. And this carpet is something sacred and should be treated that way. So step gently as you come forward um, and receive. And sometimes, the, you know, life just is overbearing us and we need to wait because we can be assured that God will come to us wherever we are. And so if you choose to stay in your spot, we will bring the communion elements to you because sometimes you can come forward and sometimes just wait upon God and God will appear. And so we're about to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. This table is open to all people and people who want to know God in a new and a powerful way, people who want to experience the love of God as we experience it in Jesus Christ. Come not because you must come, come because you may come. Come not because you're fulfilled and you're full and you know it all, but come because you are empty, come because you're seeking, come because you have questions, come because you're angry, come because you're satisfied, no matter how you come, God invites you to come forward to this table that you will know the love of God we know in Christ Jesus. Partake and share because this table is spread for you and for us that we might once again know that God has shared our common lot. God has invited us to join the people of God's new age. And God says, come. Let us pray. Loving God, we gather here this day, on this Communion Sunday. We gather here around this table, this table spread for you, and as a matter of fact, spread completely around the world as brothers and sisters in Christ gather together to celebrate this Communion table. We gather here to share these elements of the earth. Wheat turned to bread, and grapes turned to juice. We gather here because you now turn that wheat turned to bread into your body and that grape turned to juice turned into your blood that we might once again know that you have come to us, that you share our lives as we know them, that you know our pains and you know our joys and that you come here to participate in our lives in its fullness. And so we gather here and we ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon these elements of bread and fruit of the vine, spreading them before us and spreading your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us with tongues of love and fire that we can take out into the world and remind everyone that we are your gifts to the world, the gift of love. And we thank you in Jesus' name, the one who taught us all to praise you with the familiar words which we know. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we remember on the night of his betrayal and his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. <laughs> he was a lot younger than I am. And he gave it... <laughs> He blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And in like manner, again, after offering thanks, he gave them the cup, and he said, this is the sign of a new covenant sealed with my blood. Drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often 
as you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, you will do so and you will remember me. These, therefore, are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Feed on him in your heart with faith, always remembering to give God thanks and praise. Ministering, therefore, in his name, we offer you this bread and this cup. Come, friends, for all things are now ready.
Let us join together in the unison prayer of thanksgiving, which is printed in your bulletin. We give you thanks, eternal God, for the gifts of life and love we have received in your presence. Grant that in the days ahead, our lips which have sung your praises may speak the truth. Our eyes which have seen your love may look with compassion on the needs of the world. Our hands which have held this loaf and cup may be active in your service, gently embracing the earth and proclaiming shalom to all of creation. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Indeed, earth is good, very, very good. And it's filled with love. You are filled with love, surrounded with love, called to love all that God loves. So go from this place knowing that you are never, ever, ever alone. For God is love, and love goes with you. And all God's people say, Amen.